Tom Swift and His Airship by Victor Appleton Chapter 17 Wanted for Robbery Choking, gasping for breath, feeling as if they could not stand the intense heat more than a moment longer, the young inventor and his companions looked at each other. Death seemed ready to reach out and grasp them. The mass of heated air was so powerful that it swung and tossed the red cloud about as if it were a wisp of vapor. "'We must do something,' cried Mr. Damon, beginning to take off his collar and vest. "'I'm choking.' "'Lie down on the bottom of the car,' suggested Mr. Sharp. "'The smoke won't trouble you so much there.' The eccentric man, too startled now to use any of his blessing expressions, did so. "'Can't you start the motor?' asked Tom frantically, as he stuck to his post with his hand on the steering wheel the elevation lever jammed back as far as it would go i've done my best answered the balloonist gasping as he swallowed some smoke i'm afraid it's all up with us we should have steered clear of this from the first my how it roars the crackling and snapping of the flames below them as they fed upon the dry wood which no rain had wet for weeks was like the rush of some great cataract up swirled the dark smoke clouds growing hotter and hotter all the while as the craft came nearer and nearer to the center of the conflagration we must rise higher cried tom it's our only chance turn on the gas machine full power and fill a container that will carry us up yes it's our only hope muttered mr sharp we must go up but the trouble is the gas doesn't generate so fast when there's too much heat we're bound to have to stay over this fiery pit for some time yet. We're going up a little, spoke Tom, hopefully, as he glanced at a gauge near him. We're fifteen hundred feet now, and we were only twelve a while ago. Good. Keep the elevation rudder as it is, and I'll see what I can do with the gas, advised the balloonist. <laughs> it's our only hope. And he hurried into the engine room, which, like the other parts of the cabin, was now murky with choking vapor and soot. Suddenly the elevation gauge showed that they were falling. The airship was going down. "'What's the matter?' called Mr. Damon from the cabin floor. "'I don't know,' answered Tom, unless the rudder is broken. He peered through the haze, though the big elevation rudder was still in place, but it seemed to have no effect on the shim. "'It's a downdraft,' cried Mr. Sharp. "'We've been sucked down. It won't last but a few seconds. I've been in them before.' He seemed to have guessed rightly for the next instant the airship was shooting upward again, and relief came to the aeronauts, though it was not much, for the heat was almost unbearable, and they had taken off nearly all their clothing. Light and ship, sung out Mr. Sharp, toss over all the things you think we can spare, Tom, some of the cases of provisions, we can get more, we need them. We must rise and the gas isn't generating fast enough. There was no need for the young inventor at the steering wheel now, for the craft simply could not be guided. It was swirled about, now this way, now that, by the currents of heated air. At times it would rise a considerable distance, only to be pulled down again, and just before Tom began to toss overboard some boxes of food, it seemed that the end had come, for the craft went down so low that the upward-leaping tongues of flame almost reached the lower frame. "'I'll help you!' gasped Mr. Damon, and while he and Tom tossed from the cabin windows some of their stores, Mr. Sharp was frantically endeavoring to make the gas generate faster. It was slow work, but with the lightening of the ship, their situation improved, slowly, so slowly, that it seemed an age the elevation pointer went higher and higher on the dial. Sixteen hundred feet, sung out Tom, pausing for a look at the gauge. That's the best yet. The heat was felt less now, and every minute was improving the situation. Slow the hand moved. The gas was being made in larger quantities now that the heat was less. Ten minutes more of agony and their danger was over. They were still above the burning area, but sufficiently high so that only stray wisps of smoke enveloped them. Oh, but that was the worst ever, cried Tom, as he sank exhausted on a bench and wiped his perspiring face. We sure were in a bad way. I should say so, agreed Mr. Sharp. And if we don't get a breeze, we may have to stay here for some time. Why can't you get the motor to work yet? asked Mr. Damon. Bless my gators, but I'm all in as it is, boys. I'll have another try at the machine now, replied Mr. Sharp. Probably it will work now after we're out of danger without the aid of it. His guess proved correct. 
for in a few minutes, with the aid of Tom, the motor started, but the propellers revolved and the red cloud was sent swiftly out of the fire zone. Now we'd better take account of ourselves, our provisions, and the ship, said Mr. Sharp, when they had flown about twenty miles and were much refreshed by the cooler atmosphere. I don't believe the craft is damaged any, except some of the braces may be warped by the heat. As for the provisions, you threw over a lot, didn't you, Tom? Well, I had to. I guess you did. Well, we'll make a landing. Do you think it will be safe? asked Mr. Damon anxiously. We might be fired upon again. No, there's no danger of that. But I'll take precautions. I don't want a big crowd around when we come down, so we'll pick out a secluded place and land just at dusk. Then, in the morning, we can look over the ship and go to the nearest town to buy provisions. After that, we can continue our journey. And we'll steer clear of forest fires after this. And people who shoot at us, added Mr. Damon. Yes, I wish I knew what that was done for. And once again came that puzzled look to the face of the balloonist. The airship gently descended that evening in a large level field. A good landing being made just before the descent, Tom took an observation and located about two miles from the spot he selected for an anchorage, a good-sized village. We can get provisions there, he announced. Yes, but we must not let it be known what they're for, said Mr. Sharp, or we'll have the whole population out here. I think this will be a good plan, Tom. You and Mr. Damon go into town and buy the things we need. I'll stay here with the airship and look it all over. You can arrange to have the stuff carted out here in the morning and left at a point, say, about a quarter of a mile away. Then we can carry it to the ship. In that way, no one will discover us and we'll not be bothered with curiosity seekers. This was voted a good idea, and when the landing had been made, and a hasty examination showed that the ship had suffered no great damage from the passage over the fire, the young inventor and Mr. Damon started off. They soon found a good road leading to town and tramped along it in the early evening. The few persons they met paid little attention to them, save uh, to bow in a friendly fashion, and occasionally wish them good evening. I wonder where we are, asked Tom as they hurried along. And some southern town, to judge by the voices of the people, answered Mr. Damon. Let's ask, suggested Tom. No, if you do, they'll know we're strangers, and they may ask a lot of questions. Oh, I guess if it's a small place, they'll know we're strangers soon enough, commented Tom. But when we get to the village itself, we can read the name on the store windows. A few minutes later, found them in the midst of a typical southern town. It was Barno, North Carolina, according to the signs they saw. Here's a restaurant, called Tom, as they passed a neat-appearing one. Let's go inside and get some supper before we buy our supplies. Good, exclaimed Mr. Damon. Bless my flapjacks, but I'm beginning to feel hungry. The eating place was a good one, and Tom's predictions about their being taken for strangers were verified. For no sooner had they given their orders than a pretty girl who waited on the table remarked, I reckon... You all are from the north, aren't you? She smiled as she spoke, and Tom smiled back as he acknowledged it. Have you a paper or newspaper I could look at? he asked. Oh, I guess I could find one, went on the girl. I reckon you all are from New York. New Yorkers are so desperate, bent on reading the news. Yes, we're from a part of New York, was Tom's reply. When a newspaper was brought to him, after they had nearly finished their meal, the young inventor rapidly scanned the pages. Something on the front sheet, under a heading of big black type, caught his eye. He started as he read it. Wanted for robbery. Bank looters escape in red airship. Fired at, but disappear. Great Jehoshaphat! exclaimed Tom in a low voice. What on earth can this mean? What? inquired Mr. Damon. Has anything happened? happened i should say there had was the answer why we're accused of having robbed the shopton bank of seventy five thousand dollars the night before we left and to have taken it away in the red cloud there's a general alarm out for us why this is awful it's preposterous burst out mr damon i'll have my lawyer sue this paper bless my stocks and bonds i hush not so loud cautioned tom for the pretty waitress was watching them curiously here read this and then we'll decide what to do. But one thing is certain, we must go back to Shopton at once to clear ourselves of this accusation. Oh, murmured Mr. Damon as he read the article rapidly. 
Now I know why they fired at us. They hope to bring us down, capture us, and get the $5,000 reward. End of chapter.